Are we still not on? We are recording and Doug Shear, would you like to make an introduction? Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk on Art. I'm Doug Shear, president of ATOA, uh, also known as the Invisible Man. Uh, tonight is Monday, September 12th, 2022. It's 7 p.m. Eastern, and we're broadcasting this event via Zoom. This marks the start of our fall season. You can see us here most Mondays. January, by the way, will be the beginning of our 49th year. Tonight's panel is called, let's face it, the psychology of self-portraiture. And the panelists tonight are Tracy Eller, James Rauschman, and Fran Beeler, who is our moderator and organized the event. About this program, three contemporary artists, Tracy Eller, James Rauschman, and Fran Beeler, have created significant bodies of emotionally revealing self-portraits. They each have a different psychological approach using three different media, photography, painting, and drawing. Tonight's panel is expected to last around 90 minutes, including questions or comments, which can be made via the Zoom chat function, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. Fran will be selecting some of those to ask the panel or to answer herself. Then in the next few days, the recording will be posted to ATOA's YouTube channel, and ultimately, all of our recordings, all of our events, end up in our uh, Smithsonian Archives of American Art um, archive, where we already have close to a thousand previous recordings. Um, ATOA offers its programming free, and we survive off donations and an occasional grant or auction. Help us by going to the website at atoanyc.org, and you'll see support, and then contribute, and then where to donate. It's pretty simple, or even more simple is mail us a check to our box number. Tonight's moderator, who also helped to organize this panel, is Fran Beeler, and she's very excited about her new solo exhibition at El Barrio's Art Space PS109 in East Harlem running through September, uh, through the whole month of September. She will show her 366 self-portraits from 2020 and other examples of her ongoing series called Self 2020. Hung in 12 large month blocks, Self 2020 will be on view along with examples from the prior year's series, plus some of Bueller's larger self-portrait paintings as well. She has been the subject of radio, in-print, and online interviews. Uh, there's an upcoming one. There's an upcoming one in Art Spiel in conjunction with her solo show. Feature articles and reviews have also appeared in American Arts Quarterly, American Artist Magazine, and other publications. In 2020, she won the Morgan Library and Museums online portrait contest with her painting, Circle Dance. She has also received a Green Shields grant for realist art. She's also a member of the Artist Talk on Art Board of Directors. Fran will now introduce the two other presenters. Go ahead, Fran. So um, I'm actually gonna get started first and I'll introduce the other two panelists when um, when their turn comes up so their bios will be fresh in your minds as you look at their work so um, I'm gonna get started because we have a lot to do here a lot of material and wonderful things to see so let me share the screen and uh, get started with the slideshow. All right, is everybody seeing artist talk on art? Yes? Good. Great. Okay, thank you for that intro, Doug. Much appreciated and welcome everybody. It's so great to see 
so many familiar faces out there and some new faces and people from all over the country. Um, this is exciting. I'm very excited to be hosting a panel for the very first ATUA panel season for, you know, fall 2020. Um, okay, so um, let's face it, the psychology of self-portraiture. Um, I am really pleased to be your moderator for this evening's panel, and I'm pleased to have James Rauschman and Tracy Eller on the panel with me. And without further ado, we're going to get started. So what do Rembrandt and Francesca Woodman and Frida Kahlo all have in common. They each left a distinct body of deeply psychological self-portraits behind, ones that we all love. And in this age of a selfie, it may be hard to remember that for much of human history, to see yourself, let alone create a self-portrait, you had to find a body of still water or be wealthy enough to own a polished obsidian stone. But despite these obstacles, we are drawn to see ourselves, to know what we look like, and maybe more important, to know how others see us. From the early Renaissance on, self-portraiture became its own genre and remains a substantial part of many artists' creative output. Self-portraits are great to do when you want to paint a portrait and there's no one else around. I am always my most available and dependable model. Self-portraits are a great vehicle for practicing our skills, but much more importantly, they are a perfect way to express how we feel. And, you know, let's face it, we love a good self-portrait the way we love a good memoir or a TV biopic. And by the way, what is the difference between a selfie and a self-portrait? Well, we will discuss that tonight too. So here we have Van Gogh, Cindy Sherman, Courbet, Grace Graupe, Pilard, Picasso, Vijay Lebron, Basquiat, Alice Neal, Lucian Freud, Mablethorpe, Judith Leister, and Chuck Close. And these are just a very few of the other artists who have portrayed themselves in revealing psychological self-portraits. And so you might ask, what is a psychological self-portrait? We are psychological beings by our very nature and our self-portraits reflect our relationship with ourselves, with each other, with our loved ones and with our world. So, Many of you in this audience don't really have to wonder why I chose to organize this panel at this time. But for those of you who don't know, right now, I have a huge solo exhibition. Well, I guess Doug mentioned it, and thank you, Doug, um, at El Barrio's Art Space, PS 109 on East 99th Street. And it's the largest exhibition I've ever mounted. It took a solid week of 12 hour days with a team of dedicated helpers to hang over 550 drawings, paintings, and prints. It includes my latest self-portrait series, Self 2020, which consists of 366 self-portraits. It was a leap year, and one is done every single day of the year. Working on such a large series, I have a sense of what I want it to look like while I'm working on it, um, but uh, there are so many drawings and my studio isn't that big. I can only look at one month at a time spread out on my floor. Um, I had to wait until the exhibition to actually be able to see all the works together. And, you know, I, I consider this work as one big piece consisting of 366 drawings. So it was very exciting to see it go up on the walls um, of El Barrio's art space, and it's up through October 1st. Um, you know, doing my own self-portraits is, is exciting. It's scary. It's kind of insular. Um, and that's really another big reason why I wanted to make this panel, to 
invite and dialogue and share this evening with other artists who are doing self-portraits in their own unique ways. And so, and let's face it, the psychology of self-portraits, you're going to meet three artists who do self-portraits, myself, Tracy, and James. Each of us has a psychological approach, but each of us does it in their own way through three different media, drawing, photography, and painting. So thank you again for joining us for this fascinating look into the psychology of self-portraiture. And um, now going to segue into the next part of our evening. So how many ways can you draw a self-portrait? And what really is a self-portrait? I have been asking myself these questions a lot over the years. Does a self-portrait have to be a face? Does it have to look real? Can it be a fantasy? Well, of course it can. Um, so from a very young age, I have been drawn to self-portraiture. I loved the self-portraits of my early art heroes, Rembrandt and Durer. Maybe it was partly because I felt invisible growing up as a small, shy girl um, with big dreams. But I often felt like my voice wasn't heard. And I think self-portraits really spoke to me as a way of saying, here I am, and this is what's going on inside of me, even though I may feel invisible, I'm not. My father was a social worker and a psychotherapist, and my mother was an artist and an art teacher. So combining art and psychology has always felt really natural to me. In my early 20s, um, I decided that, ah, before I get there, um, these are some shots from, um, from my show some installation shots. So uh, showed, yeah, this one is, is seen from, um, this is March hanging on the wall and then the rest of the months go back. There are actually two months behind me that you can't see January and February. Um, okay, yeah. So it all started in my early twenties. Um, I decided that a visual artist should keep a visual diary. I had always kept a diary with words and text, but I thought instead of using words, I should draw the way I feel, my thoughts, my moods and emotions. And this was, well, I didn't know it at the time, but this was the beginning of my self project. And so that first um, self 1980 was done in a bound sketchbook. and. The portraits were often really expressive and dramatic, you know, very, very um, evocative of what was going on in my life at the time. And I, I had a kind of an intense year. Um, I, I had an early marriage and divorce, I had an abortion, and I had the loss of a good friend. And all of these things came up in this, in this visual diary. But, you know, I did the diary that year and then I went on to do a lot of painting and I didn't think about it very much um, for a long time. I put the book away and we fast forward now to 2000, 20 years later with a new marriage and two small children. And I really needed a project to bring me back to the studio. I was feeling, well, the way that you feel when you're a new mother, very, everything was new and exciting but also a little terrifying and I found that old notebook from 1980 and I thought what if I do another self-portrait series a day uh 20 years later and then I could could have a show of 1980 and 2000 and and the difference show the difference between my 20 year old self and my 40 year old self um so I decided not to do my my self-portraits in a bound book because motherhood was binding enough um but the portraits were a great way to make time for my art 
And they gave me a, a good outlet to explore significant psychological themes coming up in my life at the time, like parenthood and birth, endings and beginnings, gender and body image. I used a variety of media and I did 366 tiny to large works. Um, 2000 was also a leap year, like 2020. And I showed a subset of Self 20, uh, Self 2000 in, um, in a show at Gallery Korea in New York in 2003. Um, I think people often ask me if I have a favorite from certain years or from all of them. It's like asking, do you have a favorite child? And even like looking at this page, it's hard to pick a favorite. But um, not my favorite, but I'm intrigued that, that I was thinking at that time what it might be like to be a man and have a beard. So that was fun to do. Um, this drawing here was from a dream. And this was from a mood. And in this etching, I was thinking a lot about Rembrandt and his self-portraits. So, okay a little mistake on this particular slide. It says self 2000, but actually right now we're into self 2010. Um, so in 2010, my kids were in school and I was back to full-time art making. And I, I decided, you know, maybe I shouldn't wait 20 years to do the next self-portrait series. Maybe 10 years is a good amount of time and I can see again what it's like to to see my face evolving and to see you know investigate the aging process it was a little terrifying to look at my older self in the mirror but actually i found my face more complex and interesting as time went on um so in this year in uh well, still says 2000 but it's actually 2010 um, so in 2010, I made each portrait the same size, and I had a theme for each day of the week, and and uh, that kind of discipline helped me to um, uh, really explore a lot of different ideas. And here I'm thinking about, you know, um, well, I'm still parenting and in New York, but I'd love to be scuba diving or parachute jumping or. Uh, I'd love to turn into the sun and the moon and fly away. Um, so in 2014, I actually exhibited the uh, self 2010, the entire series in a show at West Beth Gallery curated by Barbara Lubliner called Time Frames Marking Time. And that was really, really exciting. And, um, you know, when I get to see the whole work as a body all in one place, it, there's just nothing like that um, to see the work coalesce. Um, and now, okay, this one's labeled, right? It says self 2020. And now we're, we're into, into my current body of work. You know, this, um, this is my fourth, body of self-portraits. I've been doing them over the course of 40 years, and it's become this unexpected lifetime journey. Um, you know, I had no idea when I started that book in 1980 that I would do it again and again and again. As you can imagine, I'm already starting to think about 2030. But um, so at the beginning of 2020, I, the first thing I thought about was what's different this year than um than last year though not last year but the last time I did my self-portraits what what's changed in the last 10 years so one thing was that I was wearing glasses all the time and I did a bunch of different drawings about my glasses another is that I was continuing to have obsession with floating flying objects so you see floating marbles and things in a lot of the pictures I had an iPhone and that was new. I didn't even have a smartphone 10 years before. And I don't know, maybe you can tell by this drawing that I have some mixed feelings about my cell phone. Sometimes I feel a little bit like I'm drowning in tech. I think we all feel that way between the Zoom and the computer or the phone. Anyway, um, 
I also did some traveling. I love to travel. I hate to pack. I guess you can see that in my drawing. Well, this was the beginning of 2020, but we all know what happened a couple of years into the, a couple of months into the year. Um, ah, another, this is another of the self portraits with the iPhone. I really like this one. And I think in terms of a psychological self portrait, I think that title is pretty self-explanatory, drowning in a sea of other people's expectations. And now here we are in March of 2020. When I started Self 2020, I had no idea what the year was going to bring. So when the pandemic hit and we had to go into lockdown, it came right out in my drawings. And I really, you know, the first one I did, I it was from imagination and it just kind of came out. I think the first one was, oh, I'm not sure. Oh. But um, uh, I, I, I think it's pretty clear that I was feeling boxed in. I think we were all feeling boxed in at that time. Um, but I took this box series and I started to think about it more in terms of, you know, yes, hiding in a box, but also the way boxes became our lifeline to the outside world. Um, how did I feel about that? I think even in the posture, you can see that, that it's a kind of a mixed feeling. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is a Swiss American psychiatrist and she created the theory of the five stages of grief and loss. And when I did these drawings, I didn't, I was not thinking about her or her theory. I really wasn't, at least not consciously, but I knew about it. And it was only later when I looked back at the drawings and I said, oh my gosh, I just illustrated the five stages of grief and loss. And the grief and loss, of course, was at our way of life. Uh, our planet, our uh, autonomy, our ability to just go out and about without worrying about this dreadful virus. I did a lot of drawings in 2020 of my shadow. And in a way, there were days where I just didn't feel like looking at myself but shadows are so beautiful and they are a part of us and I was taking a lot of late night walks in the park late night walks to avoid crowds and I would go with my husband it was safe um and the park was empty and beautiful and quiet and in fact the whole city was really quiet and the shadows were so beautiful um I also did a lot of hiking with my family in nature and that was really healing. Um, and so here we have a shadow at night and a shadow in the daylight. The shadows also began to feel for me like the shadows that human beings cast on the planet. And as pollution started to lift a bit because we were doing so much less during the pandemic, I thought a lot about our influence on the planet and bigger concerns. And then of course we had to start wearing masks and I had a lot of feelings about wearing a mask. I really didn't wanna do it, but I guess who really does? Um, the mask that I'm wearing in this drawing is actually a mask that was created by Ai Weiwei. So that's kind of cool. And I started to think about all of the ways that we, use masks, not just literal masks, but figurative masks to hide, to hide ourselves, to hide from ourselves. So I did a lot of drawings with masks as well. And although this isn't a mask, I think of it as the mask series because it's about hiding and being afraid. So this is May. 2020. 
uh, it's an installation shot from my show and a lot of the mask drawings, a whole row of them. Oh, well, well, there's like four or five of them. There's some of the shadow drawings. I, I tend to do series. I think that's common among artists. I mean, just of course doing a self-portrait a day is a series, but within that I did a lot of series because I would do something like a shadow and then I'd think, well, what if, what if I did it at this time of day or what if I was holding an umbrella? And current events came strongly into the work in a, a bigger way than they ever had before. 2020 was a year unlike anything else. And so race relations and our broken political system and climate change and wildfires, all of these things came right into my drawings. This drawing on the left is very interesting to me because I have a, a condition where I get a thing called a visual aura. Sometimes it's called an ocular migraine. For me, it has no pain associated, but every now and then I see a bright light flash in my eye and it stays there and then it, it, it widens and turns into this beautiful pattern. And if I'm lucky enough to get one of these when I don't have to rush around and do something, I can just sit down and enjoy it. You know, I guess it's the artist in me. They're so beautiful. They actually are in full color, but the black and white drawing. So you can just imagine. So here's another cell phone drawing. I really like this one. It's interesting how often I included water in my cell phone drawings, although it's not something you're supposed to put inside your phone. Um, but I really liked playing with the negative space here. And again, the idea of drowning in technology. Um, in this drawing, I have a lot of earrings that have balls, and I promise you that none of them actually has COVID balls on them, but COVID just snuck into so many of the drawings. And so, um, yeah, there I am wearing COVID ball earrings. Even in this drawing, I had this fantasy of, of being in a crowd. And you might remember, especially in 2020, it was kind of terrifying to think about being in a crowd. Um, because, well, that's how you caught COVID. And so I thought of myself getting stuck in a crowd and then everybody catching COVID. So all this, although you could think of it also as bubbles floating away. I don't know. My show is on view through October 1st. It's open daily. And if you want to meet me there, contact me and uh, we'll make a date. Thank you so much. And I am going to now introduce James Rauschman, our next speaker. James Rauschman got his BA from Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont in 1974. He majored in Buddhism and painting. Over the past 45 years, his work has been in various gallery exhibitions in Philadelphia and New York including group shows at Marion Locks, Mitchell Algus, First Street, Sideshow Galleries. His Cuba-themed paintings were exhibited at the Interchurch Center in 2007, the Havana Biennial, 2000, and at the Art Factory in Havana, Cuba in 2018. His work is in many private and public collections, including the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the University of Delaware and Barnard College. He became a founding work-study affiliate of the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, Vermont in 1984, and three decades later, moved with his husband to Vermont with a sense of homecoming. He describes his personal coming out process as protracted and painful, 
but he was finally able to turn these conflicted feelings into specific self-portrait paintings. They're highlighted in this talk and were gathered together for a show last year at River Arts Gallery in Morrisville, Vermont called Self Reflection. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce James Rauschman. Um, so James, wait, unmute yourself. We still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, Good. but I heard it myself. Okay. So. okay. Thank, you. Um, thank you, Fran, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I was very flattered to be asked. I have to say that um, artists talk on art almost seems like an oxymoron to me. I'm one of those people who, if I wanted to talk about what I was doing, I would be an art critic. <laughs> I'm an artist because I love bur burrowing myself in the studio and not having to talk about what I do. But I'm going to try. Um, I didn't set out to do psychological self-portraits. The show that um, was mounted last year in Vermont um, came out of a process with a curator of looking through all the work in my studio until we sort of realized that there was a show here that related to a very specific uh, trauma in my, uh, in my life as uh, in terms of coming to grips with who I, who I am, who I was, what what a self is and i've really rather than psychological self portraits being a focus painting has been a focus i've been a painter for probably 40 years you know a, a, a moment came in my life after undergraduate school when i said this is what i'm going to do i'm not going to go into real estate i'm not going to go to law school, nothing that my parents wanted me to do. I'm going to do what I think is my real self and destiny and become a painter. And the subject matter that you choose for painting is as varied and diverse as the world. So I have, I have attempted to paint as many different subject matters as I could, can. Um, from landscapes, to, to self-portraits, to still lifes, to interior scenes. And at a certain point, early on, I think I began to feel that anything that you're painting is a kind of self-portrait. I sort of believe that um, anything that an artist paints is, is in some ways a self-portrait. I'll say it again, because I, I it's, a, it's almost a core belief. Um, but nevertheless, I did attempt the genre of self-portrait both as a way of knowing what I look like and trying to figure out who I am. Um, you know, thinking about self-portraiture as a way of uh, uh, self-discovery. Um, and my paintings usually start with drawings and they, uh, the color and, and the tone are sort of two separate processes. I used to work exclusively from observation and then I started working from photographs. Um, the, the show that I had last year, this, this slide show will, show you highlights from that show sort of as we presented it um and it is not exactly chronological uh well it isn't chronological at all it's but it does show work from the past and then work from this very particular period when i experienced uh, a traumatic event in my life which i'll describe in a minute but first let's look at this painting of an eye and just um, let me say 
it's both <laughs> a self-portrait, uh, uh, a still life, and um, a sort of philosophical statement about what painting is. It's about what you see. It's about what's seen at the same time. And, you know, painting is about vision. And um, it's my eye, and the eye is the uh, portal to the soul of, in some way. And I was thinking all these things as I was doing it. Maybe we want to look at the, the next couple um, images. Can you do that for me, Fran? Yeah. This is a, a very um, straight on self portrait of myself in Cuba. Um, it's very large. It's um, it was based on a, a snapshot from a Polaroid camera, not a Polaroid, a Kodak camera, you know, not a selfie, not a cell phone. This was done in the late nineties, I think. Um, but it's, it shows you how I've been exploring self-portraiture over time. And this was, um, meaningful to me because it was an expression of a kind of liberation of myself um, in the context of Cuba, um, where I had a lot of interesting adventures and experiences. Um, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, is a scientist, and he had a, a series of um, scientific uh, um, visits there planned and I went with him and I fell in love with the place and I got a license from the from the government to go back and do a series on Cuban life and um, that was sort of the setting for this um, and but I show it not because it's terribly psychologically insightful it's really you know I look at it now and see it as very much about being surfaces and something I've loved to explore in painting. But again, it's not the sort of uh, psychological exploration that I ended up doing later in self-portraits. We could look at the next one, next. Um, these, the one on the left, the car crash is also related to Cuba. And the series I did there was a sort of diaristic series about experiences including a car crash in the middle of the night. And the, uh, the studio scene on the right is um, just an example of the kind of matter of fact, uh, you know, daily life scenes that I did for many years, feeling that they were in some ways a kind of self-portrait uh, without, without getting yeah, the, yeah, please go, go on to the next one. I also experimented with abstraction and um, in studio interiors, abstractions. And I, maybe I see myself as a stand-in for that worm that's coming out of the painting, um, looking at itself, very much trying to figure out who I am. Um, as Fran said in the introduction, my coming out process was protracted and difficult. Nobody growing up in the 50s and 60s wanted to admit that they were gay. Uh, it was not cool. Uh, it was not easy. I was not happy with myself. And over time, self-portraits became a way to try to come to grips with myself and look for, it was my vehicle to look for how to be happy with myself, something I had a very hard time doing. Then, uh, then in uh, 2015, I had a really traumatic experience where, um, and it's very hard to talk about this, excuse me if I'm flailing, but I don't usually, I'm not, as I said, I'm not used to explaining the deeper meanings behind things because I would rather have the paintings stand for them than to have to talk about them. But to get right to the center, I was involved in a lawsuit with family members. 
um, an aunt of mine who had a lot of money and had promised to give it to all her nieces and nephews was convinced by one of those nieces and nephews um, that all the rest of us were not worth inheriting the money. And I brought a lawsuit called uh, Undue Influence because having visited my aunt while she was in her de declining years, one day I realized that something had changed, that my cousin was not letting us talk to her, that she was being uh, you know, mistreated in some way. And so I brought a lawsuit and I had to go to court. And in court, they accused me of doing all sorts of things like um, um, trying to seduce my cousin's uh, son's <laughs> wife's younger brother, who was a teenager. They brought up my gayness as um, a sort of mark of Cain. And apparently she had made my aunt believe all these things. And my aunt who has always accepted me, accepted me as an artist, as a gay man, accepted my partner, had turned against us. And there was nothing we could do in court, but it suddenly threw me back on all the feelings of self doubt, guilt, hatred, and, um, uh, you know, in unhappiness with who I was that I, I, I'd experienced growing up. So in 2015, this whole series, which I'll show you now, sort of exploded out of me. It started with more direct uh, uh, confrontational, looking at my face like this one and the next one. Um, we, yeah. Um, and, um, and evolved into something like uh, self-scrutiny, which is this painting in which I find myself looking at myself in a painting, out of a painting. Excuse me, I don't see your paintings at all. Oh, um, sorry. Um, I see them. Fran? I, I, I'm seeing problem them. With, uh, with Sandra's Sandra, computer. I see them. Okay, so um, Sandra, Sandra, we can't fix your problem right now. So why don't you listen to the talk and then you'll be able to see the images when the recording comes out on ATOA, okay? Thank you. Everybody mute and James is gonna continue with his talk. Thanks, sorry. Um, and uh, so after many years of sort of looking at myself trying to paint self-portraits, this bad experience um, with the family where my sexuality was brought up as, um, you know, the reason why I was not getting an inheritance, made me unlovable, all that sort of thing. Suddenly all these paintings started to pour out where um, I was, and Fran, you could just sort of keep going with them. I'll, I'll, or, you know, this one is called Voices, and it was what I was experiencing, the sound of people laughing at me, mocking me in my head. And, and at, you know, a bad experience enabled me to sort of finally get to the core of what I wanted to do in self-portraiture, which was how I was feeling, not how I looked, but how I was feeling. Let's see the next one. Yeah. I felt completely, you know, I felt ugly. Um, you know, looking close up at every extended pore, every blood vessel, my ugly nose, you know, I, I went for it and looked and painted it the way I, the way I was afraid I appeared to other people. The next one, um, you know, the emptiness I, I felt inside at having been, you know, torn down like that. Um, the next one, uh, almost comically, 
that I'm being portrayed as a monster and I'm adapting that, that role. And um, I've, I've often felt that, that, you know, the outsiders in society, gay people are, you know, branded as, you know, almost as, as monster-like to other people. Um, and, and Frankenstein, the Frankenstein movie always appealed to me because of his, his sort of pathetic, uh, you know, put upon character. Um, so, so this is this is a funny one. This is called wrestling with myself. The next one, which I hope it, the meaning is clear. That's what I was doing. Am I good? Am I bad? Uh, you know, um, you know, based on a, a an ancient Greek sculpture, but I put myself in there, and you know, also as a way of accepting my fat tushy too. Um, let's, let's go on to the next one. Speaking of the fat tushy, this is called uh, Man on Wire based on the, an image from the, the, the movie of the same name where in real life, Philippe Petit walked across a, a, a high wire from between the World Trade Center. And I, I imagine myself doing the same thing, but naked you know, revealing myself as I'm doing to you tonight and as I felt I did in this courtroom um, where I was exposed and, uh, and, you know, somehow trying to manage to maintain my balance and compose her at the same time. So that's what this one's about. Uh, my aggrieved status, have a heart, you know, you're tearing it out of me, you people. Um, and I must say, I got a little bit of satisfaction out of going to get a, 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 a beef heart from the butcher and, and taking myself a picture with myself and imagining it's, you know, it's cut out. And, and that's really, you know, I felt that aggrieved. Um, the next one, anger and fear. These came out very spontaneously. And I mean, I really couldn't have, uh, you know, planned exactly what I was going to do before I did them. They just, once they were finished, they seemed to express what I needed to express which is sort of the goal of painting. It doesn't always happen. Um, you know, especially if you work in genres the way I do, it's where the emotion comes from. Uh, sometimes is a mystery and sometimes it doesn't come. And sometimes you're just, you're just showing what you see, but you want what you see to express what you feel too. So let's, let's see what the next one looks like. <laughs> um, as we went on uh, sick of myself so painting you know I was painting all of these in sort of rapid succession and they the images weren't stopping I would go to sleep you know at night and wake up and thought oh I want to do this and I guess it sort of says you know um I'm just, you know, this bile is pouring out of me and it's who I am. And, um, and I was able to, to, to create an image out of that. Next. James, before we go on, someone's ask, it says, someone says uh, she'd really like to know the sizes of some of these paintings. Most of the paintings are um, 24 by 36 in that range. You could relate this one to um, to the other painting in Riverside Park, but now the imagination has taken over, and I don't know. Some people see it immediately; other people have to be directed. There's another face in the forest. It's sort of a surreal face in the forest. That's again, I'm being haunted by myself and trying to figure out who am I. You know, it's it's the age old question, but 
I got to say that these paintings helped me come to a conclusion on that, on that. Not that I ever could explain it, but they put it, they put a stop to the asking after a while. Let's see what's coming up. Yeah, the many masks and selves that we contain all spilling out. Um, split personality. Although actually this was heading towards a kind of unification of my personality by getting all the different selves out there. And the next one. Yeah. Um, it, it reminds me of the original self scrutiny where, where I'm looking at myself in the canvas. And as silly as this is, after this process of painting all these pictures, I'm now willing to touch myself. And again, accept who I am in all my humanness and, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I'm gay, I'm sexual, I'm hungry, I'm a person who does, you know, what everybody else does. And by touching myself this way, I'm sort of accepting myself, I think. I'm glad I'm in a therapy session right now with you guys. Thank you. Um, photo repair. Towards the end of this series, I, I'm putting myself back together. I, the, the two halves don't exactly mesh, but um, I'm back together again. And this was about a, year of, a year's worth of work. Um, the next one. As I, as I told Fran and, and, and Tracy, this is a purposely ambiguous. I don't know whether I'm you know, taking the flowers out of the painting or giving the flowers to the painting. It's a sort of thank you to art, which, is, which gives and receives uh, for me, or thank you to painting um, in this case. This, this came towards the end of the series and uh, I, I, I was really appreciating that on the canvas, I was able to work all this stuff out. Um, I think that's how I would interpret this. And then these two are, you know, just like, yeah, this is what I like to do. And new descending a staircase, this is who I am, sort of in, in funny cartoony style. And and I think that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. That is indeed the <laughs> last one. So yeah, yeah. I'm going to stop the share. Mm -hmm. now. That you. was powerful. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, we've gotten a lot of wonderful comments uh, okay. from people. Very powerful work. So powerful, wonderful, and so courageously fluid and organic. And <laughs> thank you for sharing your very accomplished paintings and your courageous sharing of who you are in these wow. pictures. The softness in your face also shows us the transformation you've been through. This is an incredible series and very brave. Wow. Sometimes you got to do it. And, and thank, thank you. I got to say that both Fran and Tracy who we, we did a run through before and, and knowing that I was in good hands enabled me to just come out here and just speak my truth, as they say, speak your truth <laughs> without many notes. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you, friends. Thank you, friends. Thank you. And so um, now I'm going to introduce Tracy Eller. So Western Massachusetts based photographer, Tracy Eller specializes in editorial, lifestyle, and portrait photography. Capturing the essence of a person or place has always been a driving force for her. Her personal work utilizes the tool of self-portraiture as a way to heal and transform. She is interested in the self-inquiry that lies beneath the day-to-day -day and strives to use the camera to coax it to the surface. Since picking up a camera at age 16, she has sought to capture that multifaceted inspiration that erupts from the world around her and reflect it back. 
In addition to exhibiting her own work, she has also curated shows with other photographers. And she also leads going within self-portraiture as healing workshops. And now um, I welcome Tracy Eller. And so you're gonna need to unmute and share the screen. And James, you should probably mute and I'm gonna mute too. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, everyone. Um, I am so honored to be here. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, James. Thank you, ATOA. Um, I'm really excited to talk about self-portraiture because um, my whole process on self-portraiture has uh, evolved. Um, I, like James, did not really set out to do self-portraiture. Um, I am a photographer. I do, I was doing fine art nudes. I was doing travel stuff. Um, I'm kind of known for portraits in general, but not self-portraits. Um, I was always more comfortable being behind the camera than being in front of the camera. So, um, so when I started doing self-portraits, it, it really, um, it, it was, it's evolved and evolving. I'm, I'm still exploring the medium. Um, I, I came to self-portraiture, um, again, like James, uh, with a traumatic event. Um, my traumatic event was my relationship of 15 years um, dissolving uh, rather um, in one swift blow. Um, my partner uh, told me that he had met someone else and that it was his destiny. So I'm like, okay, I, I am not going to stand between you and your destiny, but in in stepping aside and and finding that out, I um my bot you know my world just collapsed the bottom the bottom fell out and so I really I just was a mess um, I was sitting in my studio I I, I was just kind of comatose I was crying I was I just I didn't know where to go what to do I, I was just literally um, lost. Um, so at the time I was uh, talking to a, a really close friend and, and she encouraged me to pick up the camera. And uh, she made me promise one day to do a self-portrait and send it to her. Um, this self-portrait, uh, do you, you see it? Uh, let's see, maybe I need to start Yeah, the slideshow, sorry. Um, this this was my first self portrait. Um, she she was like, "That's good, that's that's good, Tracy." But I I really think that you need to do um, more, and you need to do nude self portraits. And I at the time was like, "Oh my god!" I the thought of doing nudes uh, really scared me. Uh, self portraits uh, alone scared me. Um, and nude self-portraits really, really terrified me. I mean, just, it was just, um, I was afraid to look at myself. I was afraid to look at my pain. I was afraid to look at my vulnerability. Um, I had just turned 50. Um, you know, I suddenly felt unlovable. I felt like, uh, is there life after that? Can I, can I pick up the pieces? And, um, so anyway, so I, but I leaned into her advice and um, I did, this was my first, my first nude and doing nudes earlier on, um, I had this idea of what a nude was, I, you know, it's fine art, it, it has to look pretty, it has to be sculptural, um, the use of props, uh, you know, it had to be art, it had to be something other than what I was feeling. Um, so I I worked really hard <laughs> to to kind of go, okay, I'm gonna do this. And um, so so I did this. Um, this is my first one, call it awakening. Um, and then I did this one. Um, again, the use of props, the use of a, you know, trying to be something, trying to uh, be pretty. I was still trying to be pretty. Um, this one, um, I'm starting to kind of, I was in a friend's place. Um, I was still living with my ex, uh, and 
you know, dealing with, with all of the emotions in that. And luckily, and thank God, my friend was traveling. Um, she was going to Nepal for two weeks and she let me stay in her place while, while um, she was gone. So this is uh, one of the first portraits I did in her place um, called The Bath. But again, it's still kind of self-conscious. Self, um, then I, I, I just kind of one day I was just feeling so bad. And I, I started to know the power of having something to anchor me. So every day I was doing a self-portrait and it was the only thing I had at the time. It was my anchor. It took me out of the pain. Um, I was able to um, focus on something other than um, what was going on. But this day I was just really just, I just lay down, I put the camera, all these are camera on a tripod and self-timer. Um, I just was like, okay, I'm just going to lie here. I, you know, I just didn't really have the wherewithal to try to be pretty. And it was this shot that I, once I saw this, I was like, wait a minute, you know, something shifted here. Um, and a new, you know, a new way of looking at it started to emerge. Um, I was starting to think about narrative um i was starting to think in the moment of where i was and and less about me being pretty but like what was happening in that moment for me um this is my morning coffee my morning tea kind of thing um the exploration of movement um and spatial the descending ascending um idea I was um, taking, you know, on to the next step, so to speak. This one I call bowing to the season of change because this happened right around this time. It was in October when, um, when this all started to shake down. Um, so I was on her porch and she had this beautiful tree and I just really was, I, you know, as it was, you know, the fall colors coming in. I really was bowing to the season of change because I knew it was a season of change for me, for sure. Um, this is the next day, uh, that same tree. And in the front yard of my friend's house, I was I was trying not to have anybody see me. Um, and uh, But yet I was in the front yard. I had a little robe and I kind of let the robes kind of fall away, you know, and I took the self-timer and did a few of these and had to grab my robe every time I ran up on the porch and ran down and ran up and ran down, um, all the while trying not to be uh, seen, which is kind of funny because it's a self-portrait, right? <laughs> um, this is, so I also in my studio, so I was doing um, a lot of these in the studio and um, and on location wherever I was staying at the time because I was starting to couch surf um, at this time because I really, it was hard to be at home. Um, so this was just again, exploring the movement, emotion. This one I call ready to receive. This was really the feeling of like what, what good can I, you know, bring in and uh, how can I, how can I receive now in a new way? Bedside Manor, this was in my old house. This is um, just that feeling of wanting to crawl into myself. feeling the pain using, I like to use light and shadow um, to evoke some sort of mood. And, and again, I would take many, you know, many takes to get the one, but once I got the one, I, I always knew that was it. I, I had kind of achieved what I was trying to achieve in that moment. Um, but as I started to, you know, as these started to happen and I started to see these um, take shape, um, the new narrative started to emerge, you know, the pain, um, sort of my aging body, the un feeling unlovable, it, it started to shift. 
and I started to see strength in my vulnerability. And I um, started to feel stronger. And again, every day I was, I was, you know, flexing this muscle, this, um, you know, it was the creative muscle, it, but it was also the muscle of, of looking, you know, really looking inside and inward and, um, and tapping into that strength. Um, embracing myself. I, I feel like the self-portrait for me in this time frame was a way of embracing myself. Um, it was self-love because otherwise I would not, I truly do not believe that I would um, have made it through that time if I hadn't had that anchor. Um, it was really a form of a life raft for me. Um, I call this transition sort of the movement again from one phase into another. This is feeling split. This was right out of a shower, um, bathroom mirror. This I call the lantern. Um, sometimes I had an idea of what I wanted to try to do. Um, express, um, you know, like a line or title would come before. And sometimes the line or title would come after the piece. This one was sort of the lantern. Somehow I was looking at the lantern as a beacon, um, as a light, uh, a way to um, take me into the next, you know, the next realm, light my way, so to speak. And uh, this is kind of how I illustrated that. I was exploring some um, double exposures, the wave of sadness. And this is truly how I felt most days, just head on my stool, just like, oh God, you know, can I really pick up my head and do this? Um, you know, just walk through the day. The ledge. I I was inspired this one with the curtains in my bedroom and and just thinking, oh, if I could just melt into the curtains and just drop off into the abyss, how how nice that would be. Call this reaching out for nothing. Um, it was an exploration of sort of negative space. Um, play on light. I like that my face is in the shadow but the hand is outstretched and lit and ready. But it also is like, I was, it also was part of the, the relationship for me was I was reaching out for nothing that I, I, you know, it was like, I didn't realize that, but that was sort of how the relationship really was. And again, this is play on light and shadow, what's next? And this is moving day, me with all my boxes. Um, just kind of waiting, waiting for the day to come. Um, I think this was the day before I moved out. And this is a kitchen cupboard. Um, I, I think of this piece as sort of the, one of the touchstone portraits of the whole series. I This was one that I wanted to do even before I did it. I knew this was a piece. Uh, I was going to wait till the end, wait till I moved out, wait till everything was gone. And then I could crawl into the cupboard and illustrate this. This is um, in the new place. Um, again, now I'm in a whole new environment. Um, by this time, it was winter, and I'm in this old house, drafty farmhouse, but there was this one porch where the sun would pour in. I used to love to go and sit in there. I call this the empty cup. Um, I guess that's self-explanatory. Um, the cup itself has got a crack in it. It's an old cup. Um, and yeah, that's how I felt. It was an empty cup at that point. 
the looking glass, the window light, eating alone. Um, that was one of the things that I missed about being in a relationship was, you know, having that partner to eat with um, and eating alone. This was another one that I was trying to, that I illustrate that was kind of trying to dictate um, kind of the feeling of, yeah, being alone. Valentine's Day. This was on Valentine's Day. I shot this. No beginning. And again, you know, as I was looking, you know, I I started to do more conceptual stuff. Um, this, I call this planting the field of ashes. And um, this was something that I, I wanted to um, portray. Planting the field of ashes came first. And then how do I, how do I illustrate planting the field of ashes? So I asked some friends to help me with um, making a field of ashes um, that I could plant with rose petals. This is called secrets. So that so now a new narr so narrative is starting to happen here in a real way. And like that idea of the secrets that I didn't know or secrets that I have or um, secrets that I don't want to share or or secrets that are discarded. I mean it's you know it could be interpreted in many ways. This is self-portrait love. This was an old um, frame from an old vintage pocketbook. Um, and then a little Milagro hand with a heart in the middle. And Milagros are, they're um, talismans of healing in um, Mexico and South American countries. Um, and I love Milagros. I like to collect them. Um, and it seems appropriate. Call to action. Torn at the butterfly transformation. It's classic transformation um, symbol, but the the being torn is kind of like uh, James' self portrait where he was torn. It's like trying to fit the pieces back together, um, and and feel that transformation really taking shape. This was this old house um, up in Colerain, this a town up in the hills here in Massachusetts. Um, it's like a house from the 1770s or something. And I was fascinated with this whole facade and wanted to do something. I was in a friend's attic and playing on the idea of static and age and dust and but not this is a shadow piece. This is uh, now some of my portraits that I'm using more closed. It's not such so nude. I feel a little more liberated. I feel a little more in myself. Um, this is in the building that I live in now is an old warehouse building and I had access to this unused part of it at the time. And um, this, this was taken during COVID, like kind of hiding behind sort of the foliage, trying to like anything green, anything alive. <laughs> And then um, this uh, is I because I've been working with this, and this was such a incredible healing um, for me. Um, I knew that it was uh, other people would respond. I did a I curated a self portraiture show um, of all mediums, and um, the response that I got was amazing people really resonated with it and it was at that point that I knew that other people could use this tool that this could be a tool to help other people um not just artists but anybody going through breakup or heartache or I mean the pandemic is a transition um you know a death of a parent uh 
any number of things. Um, so I developed a six week course, um, which includes writing exercises, daily props, photo exercises and um, and conversations and discussion of what an, you know, what a self portrait is, what how to how to reclaim our, our narrative and um, and shape it as well as learn from um, the past and what's going on internally and um, and use it as a healing tool. So if you are interested in that at all, please visit me on my website. Um, there's um, information on my website, tracyeller.com. And um, thank you so much for, for being here and um, letting me share this body of work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, James. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um... So I'll just read a few of the comments that people have written um, to you. Whoa, it's gotten to be a long list. Absolutely stunning, Tracy. Um, beautiful inner outer life. And you are so part of life all around you. Um, John says, all three of you have made yourself so vulnerable. What a gift. Thank you. Um, Bonnie says, creativity as therapy. Carolyn says, ah, what we can find within ourselves when we are pushed to look. Elaine says, these are really elegant and sensual. You have a beautiful body. His loss was your gain. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy says, very sensitive and beautiful shot. The subject comes across and Peggy's a photographer. So nice compliment. Deborah says, lovely, sensitive, courageous work. And the light is amazing. Um, discovery of your body, your soul, spirit, your art and creativity, the many worlds within yourself, also healing. It's Marion. Um, beautiful, beautiful, courageous, exquisite. What a potent way to heal. Truly great work. Wonderful work, Tracy. And thanks, Fran, for organizing this. It was great to see all three of your work. So moving and powerful. Thank you, Babs. Um, so let's stop the screen share and let's uh, open this up a bit. Um, <clears throat> I'm, you know, we started about 10 minutes late because we couldn't get Doug on. So I guess we will go a little late if that's okay. I don't know if Maruna is. That's okay. fine. That's yeah, fine. fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, the first question I want to raise um as we get started with questions is, well, something that came up at the beginning. So so what is the difference between a selfie and a self-portrait? I have a very short answer, and then I'm going to hand it over to Tracy and James. Um, so I like to say that the difference between a selfie and a self-portrait, it's like the difference between a tweet and a poem. So, um, but Tracy, you had a beautiful kind of longer um, way of talking about it. Would you like to sure. share that? If I can remember what I said. Um, uh, for me, self-portraiture, you know, selfie is like, look at me, look at me, uh, you know, and self-portraiture is not look at me, um, but me looking within. Um, it's, it's more about self-inquiry and less about showy, Although we can be showy in a in a self portraiture in self portraits, but it's not like me me me. It's um, to illustrate a an emotion, and it's sometimes the viewer doesn't always know what the narrative is, but the the person doing the self portrait does. So sometimes it doesn't have to be explicit. It just has to be internal. I think um, that's one of the the, you know, the differences for me. That's great. Um, James, did you want to jump in with the, uh, you're, you're muted right now. But yeah, I, I don't think I have anything terribly profound to say, but it's just, for me, it's the difference between a moment and an extension of time. You know, mm -hmm. it's something, um, it, just to add to that, it's, uh, uh, um, Oh, I went out of my mind. Just let, let's leave it at that. Between, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Um, you know, I was also thinking, 
James, with what you said, that anything you paint is a self-portrait. And that's so interesting because there is a whole uh, branch of dream analysis that says that anything you dream is a part of yourself. It's it's representative of yourself and and i i think it's really true any creative endeavor of any kind is an extension of our humanity of ourselves um so i like that i like that um so could i just say one thing we're oh, yeah. we're talking about you know the self as if we understand what the self is <laughs> and it's like we could spend, you know, 90 minutes trying to, what is a self, you know? I mean, just, just throwing that out there, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, anyone in the audience want to jump in on that one? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm not seeing a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so does anyone have a question that they would just like to unmute and jump in and ask? Fran, it's, it's Caroline. I have a question that I didn't get a chance to ask you the other night. So speaking of selfies, your por self portraits, when you put yourself into, a, well, so it's two questions. When, how do you decide the context of your self portrait? And do you ever take a selfie and use that as your uh, reference? So that's, that's a great question. So first of all, yes to the selfie. Um, because, well, at, at, at first in 1980, uh, that just wasn't an option. I mean, I could take a photograph and wait for a week or two until it was developed and all that, but, but I didn't. I really used mirrors only. Um, and then as the years went by and photography became more accessible and digital, I started using photography more and more and I have found it really freeing because in the past, if I wanted to do a portrait of like the back of my head, then I would have to set up three mirrors or, you know, if I wanted to do a profile, let's say. Um, so, so it's so much easier to, to shoot a picture. It's very seductive. Uh, and I really do try hard not to do it all the time. So a lot of my portraits are still from mirror. Uh, and I, but I like to combine photography and mirror work um, together and imagination. So all of that comes up. Um, and as far as the context, that is a really good question because sometimes I have an idea in advance of what I wanna do and where I wanna see myself. And sometimes I draw myself and then later, sometimes a long time later, I think of what's happening around me and, and it kind of comes as an inspiration as to what I might put behind me. So with my self-portrait practice, because I have this self-portrait a day thing, and I'm fascinated that we all have, like James, you did them over the course of a year and Tracy, you were doing them one a day also, or, or maybe more than one, but every day. Um, so my rule for myself was as long as I started the drawing on the day, it didn't matter when I finished it. So some of my drawings took a long time to do. Some of them took weeks and weeks. Some I came back to later. But as long as the intention of the day was there, that that was all I cared about. That, well, that was going to be my other question because I was so <laughs> all in awe of all these complete uh, drawings. And it's like, one a day. I, I, I just, I'm lucky if I'm at, if I have three meals a day. So thank you for <laughs> adding that in because I was like, wow, <laughs> I need more hours in my day. I think <laughs> it is crazy because some days I was backed up with a week's worth of drawings to finish. It was like, oh my God, wait a minute. <laughs> and then the next day comes and I'll do another one. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And since I just had the micro, I just thank you all for sharing your work. It's so powerful. And as somebody who's really not done a true self-portrait, certainly I come at my work, I'm 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 in awe. And thank you so much for sharing your stories. Uh truly. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um I have a question. Um yeah. Fran, just on your work as as you were showing it and talking about it. Um did you actually get in those boxes? Or... Uh, no, <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Not one. 
<laughs> yeah, right. was, well, I was wondering if you did. <laughs> I know, I know. I didn't even get in the suitcase. Um, and in fact, sometimes I used reference photos of other people. Like I looked online, person in box, person in suitcase. And then I try to adapt the body to my body and, um, you know, sort of use that as a reference. Um, Marion has a question. You have your hand up. Well, it's not exactly a question. It's just sharing some thoughts. <clears throat> That's okay. Um, yeah. yeah, so I was thinking that, um, uh, let me just get rid of that um, hand thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that, like, I think in all of the different, um, you know, portraits of yourself, self-portraits, um, there was something that was like revealing about the different ages like we all like we all have the different you know parts of ourselves from child until the present and we also evolve you know we grow we change so i feel like you all were able to reflect that in your drawings how we change over time which is about our lives so it it's a very intimate sharing it's a, it's really a gift because it makes me think about myself and i i imagine everybody in a way how you know the feelings that were so palpable for each one of you you know going sharing different parts of your life it was very touching and um i don't know where i don't think words can convey what you did in in your pictures so it's great that you're all artists and that you could share and also, you know, share the more intimate parts of yourself and in a world. Thank you so much. So really Fran, I think this is a good, good moment for me to jump in here. Okay, thanks, Doug. Speaking. Uh, I'd like to thank the three of you, Fran Beeler, Tracy Eller, and James Rauschman for presenting what I thought was really amazing work. Uh, I'd also like to thank members of our programming committee uh, and its director, Kristen Eichenberg, who's not here tonight. I'd also like to thank our Zoom and YouTube team, Guru Stratton and Natalia Dragnea. And thank all of you for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you again soon on another Monday. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doug. Yeah, ATOA, a round of applause for ATOA and for my co-panelists. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Good night, everybody. Good night.